Our very first speaker this morning is the co-founder of the Plantrition Project and the International Plant-Based Nutrition Healthcare Conference, my dear friend. He specializes in regenerative medicine. He's a former Olympian himself. He served on the US bobsled team, and he now serves as team doc for the United States bobsled team. He is a prolific speaker and author. His book, Alive, The Physician's Biblical and Scientific Guide to Nutrition, was published a few years ago. Scott is making such an incredible impact in the work that he's doing through the Plantrition Project. He serves as the uh, Board of Directors Chairman, Chief Medical Officer for the organization. So please, please give a very, very warm welcome to Dr. Scott Stoll. Well, it's nice to have you all this morning. Thanks for joining us. This is our first East Coast Conference. We did this on the East Coast because we really want to create greater access for this information and a greater opportunity for healthcare providers to receive this life-changing scientific information so that they are empowered to go back into their clinics and begin helping uh, equip their patients to make a lifestyle change. So our vision is that, you know, in the next few years, this room will be filled with healthcare providers from Europe, from the United States, from South America, from Africa, um, everywhere that's more accessible to the East Coast. I've been doing this maybe 17 years now. It's amazing and exciting to see the momentum that is growing in this plant-based space, isn't it? You know, all of these new companies, all of this new energy around plant-based nutrition. It gives me great hope that there is going to be change, that we're seeing amazing changes, and that this, in the next five years, we're going to see a radical transformation of our world. Um, today, I just wanted to take uh, the first hour and kind of do an overview of plant-based nutrition. I put together a talk that highlights the power of plant-based nutrition to change every element of our world from the atomic to the global. And so it's just a great overview of science as well as some environmental and agricultural science that illustrates that plant-based nutrition is like the, the string theory or the unifying theory of physics that they're always looking for in physics to, that unifies the universe. And I really believe that plant-based nutrition is one of those kind of unifying theories that if we understand the power and the cornerstone influence of plant-based nutrition, we see that when people start to change what's on their plate, it has a profound impact on every element of uh, this entire ecosystem and our food web. And so we'll spend the next hour going through some of this information and hopefully re-inspiring you about plant-based nutrition and teaching you some new things and setting the stage for our amazing speakers that we have this weekend. So in the beginning, food was beautiful. It grew on plants, it grew on trees, it grew in the ground. And for most of human history, we understood what food was. It was whole, and we named it by name. Nectarines, berries, tomatoes, tubers. Food was colorful and bright, and we know from the science of food that our eyes are attracted to the colors of food. And the colors of food indicate, at least to our body, some of the nutrients that are available in those foods, and so we have a natural attraction, a natural predilection to reds and yellows and greens. And food was whole. It was in its entirety. It had not been reduced down, or we hadn't even reached the point of talking about a reduction in the language around food. We didn't talk about nutrients. We didn't talk about phytochemicals and antioxidants and minerals and vitamins and resistant starches and fibers. We just understood food in its whole nature and state. And we made decisions about what we ate based upon whole foods. And we made decisions about what to cook and meals around whole foods. And so the whole was powerful and the whole influenced our thinking and our decision making. And soon we learned to cultivate the ground and to grow more food. We moved from the hunter-gatherers. And interestingly, the research shows that uh, in hunter-gatherer societies, they were only successful in hunting one out of 19 times. So the vast majority of hunter-gatherer societies, they were gatherer and occasional hunters. They gathered the majority of the time. But over time, they learned to cultivate food. We learned to grow food in the ground. And we developed this powerful relationship with the soil. And as we cultivated food, we began to produce more food, and it developed community and relationship around food. People would grow food, and most of the early farms were, uh, they had a multiple of crops, and they rotated crops. 
and it fostered community because people would buy food from their neighbors and they would share food. And so it became this wonderful integrated aspect of society. But then out of the age of the Enlightenment and through the Industrial Revolution, we began to change the way that we thought about food. We began to think more reductionistically about food. We began to break things down into their component parts. Out of the Industrial Revolution and the Age of Enlightenment, uh, comments like this came, mankind's final coming of age, the emancipation of human consciousness from an immature state of ignorance and error. And it, it bred this idea that the ways of the past are old and should be left behind, and that with modern science, we can reinvent the way that we live and eventually reinvent the way that we eat. The idea of reductionism began to replace holism, and reductionism, uh, especially for those of us that are clinicians, we appreciate reductionism because it's allowed us to identify uh, infections, antibiotics, to eliminate many of the communicable disease problems in the world. So reductionism is not negative, but reductionism needs to be always taken back into the context of the whole and understanding the relationships of the parts to the whole and the relationship of the decisions that we're making to manipulate the parts and the impact that it has on the entirety of the whole. Through the Industrial Revolution, we began to transition into urbanization. People moved out of the country, out of com uh, community um, with nature and with the soil and with one another into larger industrialized urban areas. We began to automate food production and then exploitation was also an unfortunate part of the Industrial Revolution. We began to exploit the soil, we began to exploit nature, we began to exploit animals, and we also began to exploit children. You know, some children work 14, 15 hours a day, eight to 10 or 12 years old. Uh, this is a large canning facility where whole foods were taken in and processed. And so out of this industrial revolution, we began to automate food in a different way. We began to think about food in a different way. Rather than whole foods unprocessed, we began to think about processing foods and shipping foods. And many of the wonderful inventions that came out of the Industrial Revolution have positively changed us, but they have negatively impacted the food system. You know, the railway system opened up transportation across the country, but it also opened up opportunities to transport food from one part of the country to another. And as businesses began to see new markets, they began to strategize ways to process and canned foods so that it could be shipped over longer distances and still maintain its freshness and taste when it reaches its destination. In many ways, this is uh, a double-edged sword today. We enjoy foods from around the world and we're very blessed to do so. But in uh, the negative sense, we began to like break foods down and add things to foods to enhance the transportability of the food. Refrigeration, which we're all grateful for today when we can open the refrigerator and pull out strawberries and blueberries and blackberries, also changed the way that the food system was manipulated because now they could have refrigerated cars and ship dairy across the country. We began to see for the first time conglomerates of food corporations and marketing of food. The first canned foods were in the late 1870s with larger canning facilities that followed. We began to pasteurize food and we began to market food for the first time. Then in 1938, there was the Agricultural Adjustment Act, which began to fix prices for farmers on dairy, hogs, chicken, wheat, and corn and cotton. And so because that gave a safety net for farmers, it predisposed farmers to begin growing those foods. And we moved away from farms where we grew a variety of crops. We moved away from farms where we grew foods that may have been more beneficial to the health of populations and started to utilize these foods as a part of our food system. And so in this way, our food system was influenced by the, uh, by the amount of food that was available, this, this incredible resource. And then war always changes culture. World War I changed culture because that was the first time there was a general education of the public on calories. Because there was a thought that if we could save calories, calorie dense foods for the soldiers, we could supply the, the needs of the soldiers on the front lines in a much greater way. So during World War I, they actually started to list calories on menus in restaurants. And they were advocating to people to eat less calorie-dense foods and save the calorie-dense foods for the soldiers, which is probably good advice, and we should have stayed with that advice and not gone backwards. 
out of World War II, they also began to shift away from this idea of maintaining food, and there was a lot of marketing around the food restrictions during World War II. But the consciousness of the American public was changed during World War II because the thought was that if we are successful during World War II, then I can eat a calorie-dense diet. And some of the advertising that came out of these, um, these war restrictions were things like this. What this war is all about is to walk once more into any store in the land and buy anything that you want. Or this one, a steak for every frying pan, a successful war. So that begins to shift the consciousness of Americans that when we are successful, we can have a steak in our frying pan every day. Or the janitor's appetite for a sirloin steak is as profitable as the banker's. It would democratize the benefits of prosperity. So really interesting how it began to shift thought around food. And then out of World War II, because of some of this marketing and consciousness that had evolved, we saw a rapid production uh, increase in animals. Uh, going from 68 million cattle pre-war to about 132 million cattle post-war. And today it's about 10 billion animals and chickens, all told, uh, that are slaughtered for food. We moved away from cattle that grazed on grass and began to feed cattle a new food, which is corn silage, because we were shifting animals into these large feedlots for greater production. It was also the advent of the silo out of this time. Because we moved animals from a natural state feeding on green grass into these large cattle yards and began to feed them differently, shifting their own microbiomes, they began to have stress, elevated cortisol levels, and a greater risk for infections. And so we had to introduce antibiotics into the, uh, the feed production uh, in order to prevent uh, infections and the loss of animals. And today, this is the greatest source of antibiotic resistance. It comes from the uh, animal industry. Uh, and they're actually finding today that some of those resistances that are, are modified in the animals are taken up by our own microbiome and by the bacteria that we're susceptible to, and it's the number one cause of antibiotic resistance in humans today as well. Uh, the fish industry is also uh, now one of the leaders in antibiotic uh, use and antibiotic resistance. As the dairy industry grew, we developed automatic milking systems in 1948. Because we now had huge feedlots with lots of animals, we had lots of insects. In order to kill the insects, DDT was developed. It was a very efficient and cost-effective way to kill insects. The developers of DDT actually won the Nobel Prize for their, their uh, production. And it wasn't until 20 years later that we began to understand the impact of DDT. Um, the 1940s saw the advent of the fast food industry. Here's the first McDonald's and pictured uh, on the screen. And then new, larger food processing plants. We began to think reductionistically about our food and ways to improve our lives through chemistry. MSG came out of World War II. The American GIs captured some of the Japanese rations and discovered the Japanese were using a uh, derivative of seaweeds uh, to preserve their food and enhance the taste. So the food industry in America uh, identified MSG and began utilizing MSG as a preservative and flavor enhancer. Um, and monosodium glutamate, the glutamates are neurotoxic. Uh, and so it became a, a detrimental um, element of our food system. Coming out of World War II, all of these TNT plants had huge nitrogen production facilities and needed to make a transition into something else. And so they transitioned into fertilizers, NPK, nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium to put on the soils. Well, NPK works, doesn't it? It grows plants quickly and they're, they're green, but the plants are not strong. And so with it, when you have a weak plant, the weak plants actually secrete pheromones that attract insects to kill the plant because it's a weak plant. And so we had to develop pesticides and herbicides to protect the plants in order to maintain the integrity of the crop and, and create a, a greater yield. But in doing so, and in the way that we started farming, our soil was dead, which grew weaker plants. So we needed stronger levels of pesticides. In order to spray stronger pesticides, we had to genetically modify the plants to withstand the, the degree of the pesticides. We developed genetically modified plants. So are you seeing how all of these things are kind of connected by the decisions that we made coming out of World War II? 
And also, interestingly, out of World War II, the war funding gave 11 pharmaceutical companies funding to develop uh, drugs, and they produced one half of the world's pharmaceuticals. So a very powerful influence of the war on healthcare and our food system. And then we just thought that adding um, preservatives like boric acid to milk might be beneficial until they learned that boric acid actually can lead to death in infants, and so they finally stopped putting boric acid in the milk. But this is a picture of boric acid flavored or laced milk. Then in 1977, George McGovern had made a recommendation in Congress that we should cut down on meat and dairy. But because the, now these large conglomerates and food industry advocacy groups had tremendous uh, influence in Congress, there was a, fi a firestorm that, that started. And so they changed the language, which was really key. Words have amazing power. And they changed it from reduce to choose. You know, reduce is something we all understand. Choose is a lot more nebulous and doesn't have a, um, an amount or a value attached to it. And they also shifted the, uh, the concept from specific foods like meat and dairy to nutrients, which was much more confusing to the general public. And the only one that was allowed to maintain a fairly high level was uh, sugar, which was allowed a maximum permissible level of 25% of calories. In 1982, the National Academy of Sciences and Dr. Uh, Colin Campbell was a part of this. And to his dissenting vote, they codified a new official language of nutrients rather than foods. And so this initiated this whole uh, movement in scientific reductionism, where all of our concepts of nutritional education and um, understanding were codified around this idea of individual nutrients and cholesterol and fiber, fats, protein, um, carbohydrates, antioxidants. And so that it leaves a lot more ambiguity when we're reading and trying to understand these things. It also creates a lot of confusion for the general public. When, and as we all know, when we hear the different um, scientific opinions around cholesterol. We transitioned into selling food in stores, uh, and today there's on average like 46,000 items in the individual supermarket today. So we have this tremendous opportunity to make lots of different choices, and the majority of those choices are not healthy. And then um, utilizing the USDA food review, we see that there was a significant shift that occurred during this period of time uh, in the average consumption of the American diet. So in 1900, the average person ate about five pounds per person uh, of sugar per year. And then in 2000, at least 141.5 pounds of sweeteners. Now, most people are not buying five pound bags of GW sugar and putting them in their cart every week. This is because the food has been woven into our food system. Oils and fats increased from four pounds to 74 pounds. Cheese went from two pounds to 30 pounds. Fruits and vegetables that were grown uh, at home reduced significantly as people started to shop more in stores. Meat production went up. Calories increased primarily because of the uh, calorie dense foods that we were eating, especially in the processed foods. Nutrient density has declined in our fruit and vegetable production because of the way that we not only farm the soil, but the way that we have bred the plants through the years. Wheat has been bred, it's not a genetically modified crop, but we have bred wheat to withstand uh, greater processing. And so the wheat stalks are shorter and the wheat heads are stronger, but in doing so, we have changed the nature of wheat itself. In fact, uh, I was just reading a research study that was uh, looking at apples, and in order to get the same level of iron that you would get in 1950 in an apple, you would have to eat 26 apples today to get the same degree of iron because of the way that we have crossbred the plants by hybrid, hybridization and the way that the soils have changed. We've added 53 gallons of soft drinks. And I know there's a lot of people in this room that don't drink soft drinks, so somebody else is drinking our share. It's a bathtub and a half full of soft drinks. And then when we look at the TV and screen time that we've added to our lives, I mean, this is essentially the solution for all of the healthcare challenges that we face, is simply just returning back to a lifestyle in the 1900 with a few of the modern conveniences that we have today. Uh, and this also looks at uh, how we've shifted our diet uh, around the world today with processed food con uh, comprising nearly 63% of our diet, um, animal products 25%, and these are the s not the same animals that people ate back in the 1800s. Plant food 12%, but the majority of that category 
is really processed plants, including juices and ketchup and french fries. So the vast majority of the population is eating less than 5% of their calories from whole unprocessed plant foods. And I always like to show these next two pictures because I believe that um, you know, not only is there science behind food, but there's an emotional attraction and reaction to food. And so if you just look at this picture for a minute and think about how you feel when you see this food, it's brown, it doesn't have any color, to me, it seems lifeless. And then you contrast it to this. And there's a different emotional response to that food. Because our bodies naturally crave these kinds of foods. Our, our eyes are attracted to the colors. And there's an inherent relationship with these foods that bring life into our bodies. So as we move forward, I just I did some calculations on a chalkboard, pulled up my old calculus, and I came to the conclusion at the end of all of that that the answer at the bottom is whole plant food. <laughs> a whole food plant-based diet is the solution <laughs> to all of these challenging complications and equations that we're facing in our country today. So let's start at the atomic level and work our way up to the global level. And these are just some brief highlights of each of these levels. Every one of these sections could be you know, multi-day lectures because there's so much information, but this is just very high level. So at the molecular level, we see that the food that we're eating, the unhealthy food, causes uh, free radical formation and cellular injury um, that initiates this inflammatory cascade. And that's the processed food, the toxins, the dyes that are all a part of the Western diet. But we also know that endotoxins the outer covering of the bacteria have been shown to cause inflammation in the body. And so even though the bacteria may be dead, the endotoxins still cause an inflammatory reaction in the body. And what's so interesting about this study is that we look at the time after the injection of the endotoxin and we see that, you know, between three and four hours, there's a spike of an inflammatory response in IL-6 and TNF-alpha. Um, but we also can see at the same period of time, there's a social disconnection and depressed mood that happen at the same time. And I think some of the newer functional MRI studies and research is showing that there's a brain inflammation, a neuroinflammation that can be tracked with mood. And so as the body's inflammatory levels rise, it has an immediate effect on the way that we feel, both internally and it affects the relationships that we develop with other people. And so in many ways, the food that we eat not only affects us, but it affects the relationships of the people around us, our immediate family and loved ones and significant others, but it has an effect on the corporate environment as well. And Dr. Uh, Barnard had done the study with Geico and found a significant reduction in depression scores simply by transitioning over to a plant-based diet. We also know that the phytochemicals have a significant impact on NF-kappa-beta. NF-kappa-beta is one of the primary switches in the inflammatory cascade. And once that switch is flipped, it activates another 400 genes uh, in the inflammatory cascade. So there's been a lot of research through the years looking at drugs to try and deactivate NF-kappa-beta. But the research is also showing that your plant-based food with full of phytochemicals and antioxidants flips that switch off on NF-kappa-beta and therefore reduces that whole uh, activation of the inflammatory cascade. And the antioxidant quality of food really does matter. You know, it's not just shifting away from animals and toxins that's important, uh, but this research shows that the quality of the food, the amount of antioxidants and phytochemicals have a, a significant role in reducing the total uh, inflammatory um, load on the body. We can see that the low quality diet here, which is apples and pears, bananas, grapes and melons, eggplant, potatoes, zucchini, actually leads a, still a small level of inflammation in the body. But a high quality diet filled with the dark berries and the greens reduces inflammation much more significantly. And I don't have the slide in this presentation, but the, uh, there was a really interesting study produced um, and in JAK this last year, Journal of American College of Cardiology, that demonstrated that a unhealthy plant-based diet, so that would be a plant-based diet with a lot of processed food, had the equivalent risk uh, in inflammation um, as a animal-based diet. 
The only diet that significantly reduced the risk of heart disease was a whole food plant-based diet filled with unprocessed plant foods. So if we take the next step up and look at the, the genetic level, the chromosomes and the telomere cap that we see on these chromosomes, you know, we learn from the area of epigenetics that our choices are far more powerful than we ever imagined. And epigenetics is teaching us that the choices that we make today either uncoil this quaternary structure uh, that we call DNA and the epigenome that is there, um, and if we're making unhealthy choices, it unco uncoils the DNA, exposes those susceptible regions that we inherited from our parents and grandparents, and allows those things to be manifested in our lives. But if we're making good choices, whole food plant-based diet, stress reduction, uh, regular exercise, sleeping seven to eight hours a night, we're in community with loving relationships, our DNA remains coiled, those areas of susceptibility remain quiescent and they do not become manifested disease in our life. And so the power of choice is something that I always teach my patients. I want to empower them to know they're the ones that are actually in control of their health. And the epigenetics message is one of those messages that I use in my practice on a regular basis to help them understand that your choices are impacting your DNA, your inflammatory levels, your brain health, your relationships, your future, your work, your dreams, your children on a daily basis. And what we're learning from the field of epigenetics is that bite by bite, day by day, within you know, four to six hours, the food is finding its way all the way down to the level of our epigenome. And so as we're eating food, it's not, a, um, it's not this process that I think many of us grew up understanding where we eat food and see their calories burned or calories kept. It's either weight gain, weight loss. Um, it's, a, it's an active process. It's a process that is changing us from the inside out, hour by hour as we're eating this food. Dr. Talaswala, leader in epigenetics, I put this in because I just think it's so interesting how we as people like to label things based upon our area of research. So he labeled this the epigenetic diet. And he describes it's a diet rich in plant-based foods, phytochemicals that modifies DNA methylation, histone modification, microRNA expression, and it prevents all of these degenerative diseases. And so through his research in epigenetics, he's come to the same conclusion that we all have whether you're looking at the epidemiology or you're looking at randomized controlled trials, that a whole food plant-based diet optimizes every area of our body, including the epigenome. The telomeres that we saw in that, that picture are the, um, the caps on the end of our chromosomes. And as we know uh, through our education that as we age, the telomeres shorten over time. And there can be more rapid shortening with diseases, including psychiatric diseases. But Dr. Ornish, in his study, demonstrated for the first time that there was increased telomere length um, and an increased activity of telomerase in plant-based lifestyle interventions. And they actually showed for the first time that by transitioning to a whole food plant-based diet, stress reduction and activity, they were able to um, increase telomerase activity by 30% and actually increase the length of the telomere. They also showed there was an epigenetic effect on the genetic switches. And they were able to demonstrate that 48 switches that were positive were turned on, and they were able to turn off 453 of these genetic switches during the three months of the study, which is really profound that you're affecting more than 500 genes with a simple lifestyle choice. And this is just some of the data from his study showing on the left the pre-intervention and the right the post-intervention, just to give a visual effect of the number of genes that were impacted by the intervention uh, and the lifestyle choices. 2017, N. Haynes, they uh, found as well that consuming nuts and seeds accounts for a meaningful decrease in biologic aging and cell senescence, and telomeres were lengthened with nut intake. And I know there's some controversy in the plant-based world around nut intake. Um, but it's also interesting just to step back and to take a look at, you know, that some of these things are really important. Um, and, you know, I never advocate that any of my patients have a bowl of nuts on their counter. Uh, I don't advocate eating, you know, snack mixes. Um, but it, it appears that the research may show that uh, a handful of nuts three times a week, raw, unsalted nuts, may have some benefit, including lengthening the telomere. 
The cellular level as we move out, there's been some really interesting research in the last two years around the mitochondria. And as we know, the mitochondria, the powerhouses of the cell, they help to maintain glutathione levels, that really potent antioxidant in the body that's really necessary for cancer prevention. And they regulate cellular activity and protect our DNA. They serve a really valuable resource inside the cell. And there's been information in recent research studies, including Dr. Hannah Kaliova, that shows that a plant-based diet not only improves the efficiency of mitochondria, but through biogenesis creates more mitochondria. And the test case for this, I think we're seeing in the plant-based athletes, especially the ultra-distance and efficiency athletes, are realizing that as they transition to a plant-based diet, their ability to recover is much faster and the research shows that um, typically the delayed onset muscle soreness for athletes is at least 50% less than a traditional athlete. They also find that they can exercise longer without any soreness um, and that they can go further distances uh, and have an amazing recovery the next day. And I was just talking with an ultra distance athlete two weeks ago that I was working with, she's an Olympic athlete. She was saying that as she's transitioned to a plant-based diet, she wakes up and she's never sore and that her workouts are more intense on a daily basis and her gains are much more rapid uh, because she's able to recover so fast. And much of it is probably due to the increased number of mitochondria that she has in her cells. And also the increased antioxidant capacity of the body, as well as the reparative mechanisms that repair some of the micro damage that occurs during exercise. Also at the cellular level, we see that phytochemicals that are in a serving of broccoli protect mesenchymal stem cells from oxidative injuries, and they also mobilize more mesenchymal stem cells. And mesenchymal stem cells are the stem cells responsible for repairing especially the musculoskeletal system. We know that uh, phytochemicals inhibit cross-linking and formation of AGEs. They enhance DNA repair. They assist in greater cellular detoxification. Phytochemicals act as cell signaling molecules and they bind actually to nuclear receptors and they have an enzymatic effect. Mushrooms inhibit aromatase, just like the aromatase inhibitors that are often prescribed today. At more of a systems level, we know from angiogenesis, uh, Dr. William Lee at the Angiogenesis Foundation has uh, done great work in helping us to understand the angiogenesis system. And when we have this abnormal growth of blood vessels, either too little, as we see in chronic wounds, especially in poor wound healing when people living with diabetes, peripheral arterial disease and stroke, or excessive growth of blood vessels that we see in cancer, psoriasis, arthritis, and obesity, that when this system is disrupted, it can manifest in a number of different ways. And the research has shown that many of the disruptors of the angiogenesis system are the Western lifestyle. Alcohol, tobacco, stress, and many of the Western foods disrupt the angiogenesis system, predisposing people to the growth of blood vessels into the cancer cell, which allows cancer to grow and metastasize. In fact, Dr. William Lee says that he believes it's possible to starve cancer if we catch it early enough. That even though we may have cancer cells from altered DNA, those cancer cells never have to manifest as cancer because they never achieve a blood vessel supply that would allow them to grow and metastasize to other parts of the body. So they did extensive research. Uh, Dr. Lee says they moved their guns from working with the pharmaceutical industry over here to do the research on the food aspects of angiogenesis. And they found that these are the foods that optimize angiogenesis. And it's essentially a whole food plant-based diet filled with rich spices and herbs that optimizes this process of angiogenesis, essentially cutting off blood supply to fat cells and cancer cells and growing new blood vessels into areas where there's poor wound healing. Also at the system level, as we know, there's this amazing growth in the study of the microbiome, which I find to be so fascinating. And we know that the whole plant foods, the fiber and the prebiotics feed those beneficial bacteria that begin to shape larger populations of bacteria that enhance our health. It's now known that at least 75% of the health of our immune system comes from a healthy microbiome. And so when the microbiome is suppressed, our immune system is dysfunctional. Whole plant foods, especially things like green apples and onions, can assist in healing leaky gut. We know that with an unhealthy diet and populations of bacteria like Bacteroides that grow, they can begin to produce molecules like TMAO, 
which are inflammatory, not only to the endothelium, predisposing people to cardiovascular disease, but also to joints. And now they're finding the uh, kidney as well. As we shift to a plant-based diet, our body begins to reduce the total production of TMAO, thereby reducing the inflammatory stress on the body. We know that uh, more than 90% of the production of neurotransmitters like serotonin is created by the microbiome and by the populations of bacteria. So as we shift toward a whole food plant-based diet and we're feeding those healthy bacteria with the prebiotics, the body naturally begins to produce more serotonin, which may be part of the mood boost that we talked about earlier with a, a decrease in depression with the transition to a whole food plant-based diet. We also see a significant improvement in blood sugars because the microbiome produces those resistant starches, and then they feed on the resistant starches and produce short-chain fatty acids like butyrate. And butyrate helps to stabilize blood sugars over the course of three to four hours. So amazing things happen as we're eating food and it's working with that microbiome. In fact, we have more bacterial DNA in our bodies than human DNA. So at just a strictly DNA level, we're more bacteria than we are human. We know at the endothelial level that plant-based diet protects against the oxidation of LDL, that critical step in plaque formation, down-regulates all the inflammatory pathways, increases the production of nitric oxide, and reduces smooth muscle proliferation, which leads to the progressive narrowing of the vessels. We also know at the organ level that a cardiovascular system is normalized and the blood pressure is substantially reduced with a whole food plant-based diet. We just did a study on our immersions with the University of Florida, and it was fun because we all kind of get used to the natural reduction in blood pressures that can happen even in a week with a transition to a whole food plant-based diet. But for the researchers at the University of Florida, this was something they've never seen before or even believed was possible, that people could be, have their medications reduced or discontinued in one week with a dietary transition. So it's fun to see a, a new awakening and a new paradigm starting for some new researchers. We know at the gastrointestinal level that we're able to eliminate constipation. They did a study in children with pediatric constipation. It's a very serious problem, but in one week with simply a removal of dairy, they were able to eliminate 90% of the cases of pediatric constipation. Diverticulosis, we were able to resolve reflux, uh, IBS, IBD, gastroparesis, and prevent colon cancer with a transition to a whole food plant-based diet. Um, nervous system improves, as we've talked about, but ADD, especially when we remove the food dyes and the sugars, uh, behavior improves dramatically, and they showed um, significant improvement in test scores for children with ADD. The musculoskeletal system improves through improving bone density. We also see um, normalization kidney liver disease, especially non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. So lots of amazing benefits at a system level. Dr. Dean Ornish also showed in his lifestyle heart trial that at one year there was a 91% regression of angina versus 165% increase in the control group, which was on the American Heart Association diet. Artery regression decreased 82% versus a progression in the control group. And remarkably, as we see in this picture here, there was a reperfusion of the heart in just three weeks time. And that's probably due to the effect on the endothelium with the increased production of nitric oxide. They were able to reperfuse those sections of the heart that did not receive adequate blood supply in just three weeks. And they showed greater improvement in five years than one year. And because of his results, after working for more than 18 years to demonstrate the clinical significance to Medicare, they finally approved it. And it's a Medicare-approved program in their hospitals around the country, utilizing this program with amazing results. Um, and Dr. Ornish had also shared with me a number of patients that were on the heart transplant list, went through his program, improved their cardiac output significantly and to the point that they were taken off of the list for transpl transplantation and able to live the rest of their lives with their own heart. Dr. Esselstyn demonstrated in his studies reduction in plaque as we see in A. This is a cardiologist that worked down the, the hall from Dr. Esselstyn. Never gave Dr. Esselstyn the time of day until he himself had a heart attack. And then he went down the hall and knocked on Dr. Esselstyn's door and said, you know, I don't think I want a stent or bypass surgery. Can you help me? And so he changed his diet. And then the, the B um, image that we're seeing here is 18 months later after transitioning his diet that he was able to remarkably reverse his atherosclerotic plaque. What's interesting, I have um, some friends that are cardiologists and cardiothoracic surgeons. 
Um, and not all these uh, vessels open up, but what we are seeing is that there's a reperfusion of the heart through the, an angiogenesis um, optimization with a new web of blood vessels that will often grow around some of these more calcified lesions. And so in that way, you're growing new blood vessels and, and creating your own bypass uh, because angiogenesis is optimized. Also, we know in the diabetes world, and this is from Dr. Hannah Kaliova down at um, Barnard Medical Center, the whole food plant-based diet is a very effective way to not only reduce medications, improve weight, and improve insulin sensitivity, but in this study, uh, where they compared it against the uh, diet of the American Diabetic Association, um, we can see at the bottom that some really significant physiologic factors changed in the whole food plant-based diet that did not change in the ADA diet. And that was adiponectin and leptin, uh, vitamin C, superoxide dismutase, uh, glutathione versus no change in the ADA group. So all of those factors indicate that it's not just enhancing insulin sensitivity and improving the outcomes for people living with diabetes, but it's also radically transforming their entire system which sets them up for greater health in every area of their lives. And the starry sky in the background, as many of you know, is the intramyocellular fat that's responsible for disrupting insulin signaling. You know, just an example, this is a, a large meta-analysis that showed that 44% of patients with type 2 diabetes could stop their insulin in just four weeks on a whole, strictly whole food plant-based diet. And 74% of patients with type 2 diabetes on oral medications were able to leave this center drug-free within four weeks. They've also noted improved beta cell function and a significant reduction now as they're imaging these cells with a reduction in the intramyocellular fat that's inside of the cells that's disrupting the whole insulin signaling molecule. And it's not just the improvements in blood sugars and the reduction of medications that are important for people living with diabetes. Most of us have taken care of people that have a severe peripheral neuropathy and we understand how disrupting that can be to a life and sleep patterns and, um, and even wearing shoes and walking. And there's really no good treatment. The medications that we use have a lot of significant side effects and don't uh, substantially change it for the majority of patients. Um, but in this really interesting trial, it was a 20-week trial, and they put them on a 100% whole food plant-based diet. Their pain scores improved by eight points with a significant improvement in their quality of life. And in 25 day inpatient study, where they put them on 100% whole food plant-based diet for just 25 days, 81% of the people report a significant improvement in their symptoms, including numbness in just four to 16 days. And what's so amazing to me, and I think many of you that are practicing this way experience this as well, that for so many people that have injured their bodies for decades, their solution is just two weeks away that even though you can make bad choices and injure your endothelium and disrupt your angiogenesis and your microbiome, you can begin seeing benefits in early as uh, one week. That your body's natural state is toward health and that when we do the right thing, our body can naturally begin the self-renewal process when we give it the right foundation and the right environment to begin self-renewal. We know at a cultural level from the blue zones that cultures that eat healthy develop healthy cultures and individuals. Uh, we know from the research that as individuals begin to eat healthfully and a whole food plant-based diet that there's reduced presenteeism and that is going to work and not feeling well. There's also reduced absenteeism. There's a significant cost savings both to companies and healthcare and we'll talk about that in just a minute with some examples. Uh, it's easier to achieve optimal weight without the scarcity and deprivation dieting there's improved pain and mobility, improved stability. I had a patient that had come to see me, and it just, uh, I, I tell this story because it also gives such encouragement that when people want to do it, they can find a way. And she had come to see me, she had significant pain, was overweight on multiple medications, um, had just come out of a very um, abusive relationship, and she and her son were living on very little money. And she understood that a plant-based diet could radically change her life. So, she and her son decided they were gonna do it. They didn't know how they were gonna do it on food stamps, but they learned that um, a grocery store threw out their organic produce at two o'clock in the morning every night. And so they would get in their car and they would go over and they would gather this organic produce and they began to eat this food. And I didn't know she was doing this. And when I saw her three months later, 
and all of her pain had been reduced down to almost minimal pain. She got off all of her pain medications. Blood pressure was normalized. Uh, she was able to discontinue her um, medications for diabetes, and she lost 60 pounds because they were found a way to make it happen. And we also know that when we feel better, we have better relationships. And so in this way, it gives us a lot more energy to do things that are, are beneficial. Um, and as just one example, my wife just got back from Mozambique. She was doing some mission work over in an orphanage in Mozambique, and she's 50, we have six children, and all of the people there could not understand how she had so much energy to just keep going every day and to keep giving. Um, but it's because she was healthy. She had strong, um, healthy body that was able to go and to keep going. When everybody else had to sit down or wanted to go to the grocery store and get junk food, she was able to continue being of good service because her body was strong and vital. So if we look kind of more globally too, just at some of the research, a systematic review of 86 observational trials and 10 cohort trials had this conclusion which gives us greater confidence that by transitioning to a whole food plant-based diet, we can reduce our levels of body mass index, cholesterol, LDL, glucose versus omnivores, and there's a significant protective effect of a whole food plant-based diet. And so epidemiologic research is important. You know, I know there are people that want to disregard epidemiology, but so many amazing um, discoveries in healthcare, especially for populations, have come out of epidemiology, and it does give us good guidance, and it does help direct good decision-making. And so, you know, meta-analysis of epidemiology can give us uh, greater confidence in a whole food plant-based diet. We also know that healthcare systems are beginning to make some transitions as well. This is Dr. David Feinberg from the Geisinger Health uh, System, which is northern New Jersey and uh, northeastern uh, Pennsylvania. He now works for Google Health, but he said we should be investing in people and processes, not in hospitals. And he's exactly right. Building more hospitals to do more of the same is not bringing the solution, but investing in individual lives is where we see change. And so they did that. They believed it and they did it. And they created the fresh food pharmacy at Geisinger. And as a part of the study, they identified people living with type two diabetes who had a hemoglobin A1C of greater than eight uh, and self-identified with food insecurity. So they wanted to target that population first. And they found that in their area, that food insecurity was a bigger problem than they had noted, that at least 14% of the population and 23% of the children identified with food insecurity issues. Then they looked at the claims data for this group of patients, and they found that on average, they were spending between eight to $12,000 a month per individual for this specific part of the population of their patients. So they created a fresh food pharmacy where they would bring people in and have them work with a team that included a nurse, uh, a health coach, a pharmacist, and a physician, uh, and a dietitian. And through this team approach and educating them on their uh, diabetes, how to live with their diabetes, how to overcome and cook food um, through a healthy diet, they made some incredible changes. So they took 37 patients for 12 months Initial pre-hemoglobin A1C testing was 9.6, post was 7.5. And this corresponds with an overall 40% decrease in risk of death and serious consequences. But what's amazing, as these people made this transition over 12 months, they were able to decrease healthcare costs by 80% in this population. And they were spending, on average, $240,000 per member per year, and they reduced that down to $48,000 per member per year at the conclusion of this program. The program received a lot of national attention. It was written up in the Harvard Business Review. And because it's so successful, they're opening many more of these farm, fresh food pharmacies uh, around uh, Pennsylvania and New Jersey to begin reaching out uh, to this population. CDC has said that 75% uh, of the cost of our healthcare is preventable. And according to JAM, our findings have shown that the increased intake of certain foods and not enough of others was associated with nearly half of all deaths in the U.S. due to heart disease, stroke, and diabetes. But what I'd like to do is just take the last couple of minutes, maybe two, three minutes, and just talk globally about the effect of a whole food plant-based diet. So this is our planet. It's a beautiful place to live, very unique. We live in this Goldilocks zone of our galaxy, and we call it home. And if 7 billion people ate the standard American diet today, or 9 billion people by 2050 ate the standard American diet, 
it would take two Earths to feed that population. So we know that it's simply unsustainable to continue eating the way that we're eating. If everyone in the world ate a plant-based diet, we would restore five billion football fields to reforest, which would also help with carbon sequestration. It takes 12,000 gallons of water for a family for a year, and about 12,000 gallons of water to produce 10 pounds of beef. It's simply unsustainable. We know that we're losing 1% of our topsoil annually in, in the last 40 years, and that according to the United Nations, they're estimating that we may have only 60 harvests left if we don't change the way that we're farming by tilling the soil and this tremendous runoff issue that we have today. Essentially, a dump truck load of topsoil is washing out into the Gulf of Mexico um, every, every minute uh, because of uh, erosion problems in our agriculture. Regenerative agriculture, which is this shift toward the care of the system and the care of the soil, can rebuild the soil, has the potential to sequester a significant amount of the carbon, and also produce healthier food and enough food for the planet. We also know as we begin to transition to a whole food plant-based diet that we're also expressing concern and care for our animals through the elimination of CAFOs. This was a large study in 2018 uh, that looked at 38,700 farms from 119 countries, 40 different food products that represent 90% of what we eat. Uh, lead researchers said agriculture is a sector that spans all the multitude of the environmental problems. And they found that more than 80% of our farmland today is used for livestock production, but produces only 18% of our total calories and 37% of our protein. So it's a very inefficient food production system. And so again, it tells us that we need a shift toward whole food plant-based diet. Rodale Institute did a study that found that we could sequester more than 80% of CO2 emissions with a switch to regenerative agriculture utilizing cover crops and essentially have a reversal of the greenhouse gas effect. Their quote out of their study is, farming like life on earth matters. So it's not just what we eat, but it's how we grow it that's gonna impact our global regeneration of our world. Finally, this was a study that came out of Holland that tried to measure both the health score and a sustainability score. And then we can see that as we get further out towards a whole food plant-based diet, it meets both the health score and sustainability score. So it is the, it's the primary answer for regenerating our environment, preserving resources, and providing our children with a much greater future. So the conclusion of our journey is that the solution is a whole food plant-based lifestyle. That is the solution to so many of the challenges that we face today. And that's why I'm so excited that we are here today, that we're seeing the, the advent of this new revolution in the way that we eat and understanding that we are all a part of a solution for our future. And I just like to leave you with this one thought that, you know, something I like to teach my children is that we are stewards. We really don't own anything. Our Western mindset has taught us that we're owners. And in, when we are owners, we begin to um, take ownership over things and exploit things and think about competition. But really, as a steward, we think about collaboration and we think about the future generations. And so as we begin to make a transition for our own health, we can eat individually for our own health, our own strength, our own vitality, reversing disease and feeling better. But as we transition into a stewardship mentality, we begin to think about the generation that's ahead of us and the food that we're gonna leave to our children and the, the soil that we're gonna leave to our children, the environment that we're gonna leave to our children. And the beautiful thing is that the solution for all of these things is to prepare really delicious, healthy, whole food plant-based meals, breakfast, lunch, and dinner. And by simply making that one change, we can change the world. So thank you very much. It's been wonderful. I look forward to spending the rest of the weekend with you.